Hello, welcome to Goodnight Flagstaff. I'm Tammy Rauschenbach, music and theater teacher at Mount Eldon Middle School, and I'm a regular reader for Goodnight Flagstaff, but tonight I have incorporated some of my Mount Eldon Middle School theater students, so I hope you enjoy hearing them read along with me. Thank you for tuning in to our community story time. You can find a new chapter from one of our favorite family-friendly books at 8 p.m. each weeknight on the Literacy Center's YouTube channel and on Crater Radio, a local online radio station. The previous chapter is replayed on Crater Radio each weeknight at about 7.45, just before the new chapter airs. You can also listen to all previous Goodnight Flagstaff recordings on YouTube. We are currently reading from the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, Book 5, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. If you'd like to check out any of the Narnia books to read along with us at home, they are all available in the Hoopla app with your Coconino County Library card. Check one out today! Please email us if you'd like to join our team of readers and connect with your community through stories. All ages welcome. Our email is goodnightflagstaff at gmail.com. Last time we read together, they arrived at the Lone Islands, where Caspian suggests they take a small group to cross the island and be picked up on the other side by the rest of the crew. As Caspian, Edmund, Lucy, Eustace, Reepicheep, and Philemoth walk, they are captured by slavers. Then, one of the men Caspian has been seeking recognizes his face and buys him from the slavers, though he doesn't buy the others. Lord Byrne helps Caspian come up with a plan to force the governor to accept Caspian as Emperor of the Lone Islands and rescue his friends. Let's find out if it works. Chapter 4. What Caspian Did There Next morning, the Lord Byrne called his guests early. And after breakfast, he asked Caspian to order every man he had into full armor. And above all, he added, let everything be as trim and secure as if we, if we were the morning the first battle war between noble kings with all the world looking on. This was done. And then in three boatloads, Caspian and his people, and Byrne with a few of his, put out for Narrowhaven. The king's flag flew in the stern of his boat, and his trumpeter was with him. When they reached the jetty at Narrowhaven, Caspian found a considerable crowd assembled to meet them. This is what I said word about last night, said Byrne. They, all, they are all friends of mine and honest people. As soon as Caspian stepped ashore, the crowd broke into hurrahs and shouts of, Narnia! Narnia! Long live the king! At the same moment, and this was also due to Byrne's messengers, bells began ringing from many parts of the town. Then Caspian caused his banner to advance and his trumpet to be blown, and every man drew his sword and set his face into a joyful sternness, and they marched up the street so that the streets shook, and their armor shone, for it was a sunny morning, so that one could hardly look at it steadily. At first, the only people who cheered were those who had been warned by Byrne's messenger and knew what was happening and wanted it to happen. But then, all the children joined in because they liked a procession and had seen very few. And then, all the schoolboys joined in because they also liked processions and felt that the more noise and disturbance there was, the less likely they would be to have any school that morning. And then, all the old women put their heads out of doors and windows and began chattering and cheering because it was a king. And what is a governor compared with that? And all the young women joined in for the same reason, and also because Caspian and Drinian and the rest were so handsome. And then all the young men came to see what the young women were looking at, so that by the time Caspian reached the castle gates, nearly the whole town was shouting, and where Gumpus sat in the castle, muddling and messing about with accounts and forms and rules and regulations, he heard the noise. At the castle gate... Caspian's trumpeter blew a blast and cried, Open for the king of Narnia, come to visit his trusty and well-beloved servant, the governor of the Lone Islands. In those days, everything in the islands was done in a slovenly, slouching manner. Only the little postern opened, and out came a tousled fellow with a dirty old hat on his head instead of a helmet and a rusty old pike in his hand. He blinked at the flashing figures before him. Francis Benefi he mumbled, which was his way of saying, you can't see his sufficiency. No interviews without appointment except 
10, 9, 10, and 10 p.m. second Saturday every month. And cover before Narnia, you dog, thundered the Lord Burn, and dealt him a rap with his gauntleted hand, which sent his hat flying from his head. Er, what, what it all about? began the doorkeeper, but no one took any notice of him. Two of Caspian's men stepped through the postern, and after some struggling with bars and bolts, for everything was rusty, flung both wings of the gate wide open. Then the king and his followers strode into the courtyard. Here, a number of the governor's guards were lounging about, and several more, they were mostly wiping their mouths, came tumbling out of various doorways. Though their armor was in a disgraceful condition, these were fellows who might have fought if they had been led or had known what was happening. So this was the dangerous moment. Caspian gave them no time to think. Where is the captain? He asked. I am no more or less if you know what I mean. Said a languid and rather dandified young person without any armor at all. It is our wish, said Caspian, that the royal visitation to our realm of the Lone Island should if possible, be an occasion of joy and not terror to our loyal subjects. If it were not for that, I should have something to say about the stairs of your men's armor and weapons. As it is, you are pardoned, manned on a cask of wine to be opened for your men may drink our health. But at noon tomorrow, I wish to see them here in this courtyard looking at men in armor and arms and not a bag bond to see it on pain of our extreme displeasure. The captain gaped, but Byrne immediately cried, Three cheers for the king! And the soldiers, who had understood about the cask of wine, even if they understood nothing else, joined in. Whoa. <laughs> Hi! 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 Caspian then <laughs> ordered most of his own men to remain in the courtyard. He, with Byrne and Drinian, and four others, went into the hall. Behind a table at the far end, with various secretaries about him, sat his sufficiency, the governor of the Lone Islands. Gumpus was a bilious-looking man, with hair that had once been red, and was now mostly gray. He glanced up as the strangers entered, and then looked down at his papers, saying automatically, No interviews without appointments, except between 9 and 10 p.m. on second Saturdays. Caspian nodded to Byrne and then stood aside. Byrne and Drinian took a step forward and each seized one end of the table. They lifted it and flung it over on one side of the hall where it rolled over, scattering a cascade of letters, dossiers, ink pots, pens, sealing wax, and documents. Then, not roughly, but as firmly as if their hands were pincers of steel, they plucked Gumpus out of his chair and deposited him, facing it about four feet away. Caspian at once sat down in the chair and laid his naked sword across his knees. My lord, he said he, fixing his eyes on Gumpus. You have not given us quite the welcome we expected. We are the king we are the king of Narnia. Nothing about it in nothing about it in the correspondence, said the governor. Nothing in the minutes. We have not been notified of any such thing. All irregular. Happy to consider any applications. And we are we come to inquire <laughs> and to your sufficiency conduct of your office. Continued Caspian. There are two points especially on which I require an explanation. Firstly, I find no records that tribute the tribute due to these islands to the crown of Narnia has been received for about a hundred years and fifty years. That would be a question to raise at the council next month, said Gumpus. If anyone moves that, moves that a commission of inquiry be set up to report on the financial history of the islands at the third meeting next year, why then? Also, I find it clearly written in our laws, Caspian went on, that if the tribute was not delivered, the whole debt was to be paid by the governor of the Lone Islands out of his private purse. At this, Gumpus began to pay real attention. Oh, that's quite well. That's quite out of the question, he said. It is an economic impossibility, but your majesty must be joking. Inside, he was wondering if there were any way of getting rid of these unwelcome visitors. 
Had he known that Caspian had only the one ship and one ship's company with him, he would have spoken soft words for the moment and hoped to have them all surrounded and killed during the night. But he had seen a ship of war sail down the straits yesterday and seen it signaling, as he supposed, to its consorts. He had not then known that it was the king's ship, for there was not wind enough to split, spread the flag out and make the golden lion visible. So he had waited further developments. Now he imagined that Caspian had a whole fleet at Bernstead. It would never have occurred to Gumpus that anyone would walk into Narrowhaven to take the islands with fewer than 50 men. It was certainly not at all the kind of thing he could imagine himself doing. Secondly, said Caspian, I want to know why you have permitted this abominable and unnatural traffic of slaves to grow up here, contrary to the ancient custom of usage of our donations. Necessary and avoidable, said his sufficiency. An essential part of the economic development of the islands, I assure you. Our present burst of prosperity depends on it. What need do you have for slaves? For expert, your majesty, going to the calorie man mostly, and we have other markets. We are a great center of the trade. In other words, said Caspian, you do not need them. Tell me what purpose you have, what purpose they have, except put money into pockets of such as Puck. Your majesty's tender years, said Grumpus, which with what was meant to be a fatherly smile. How do you make it possible that you should understand the economic problem involved? I have statistics, I have graphs, I have... Tender as my years may be, said Caspian. I believe I understand the trade of slave, the slave trade from within quite as well as your sufficiency. And I do not see what it brings into the islands, meat or bread or wine, or beer or wine, or timber or cabbage or books or instruments of music or horses, or armor, or anything else worth having. But whether it does or not, it must be stopped. But that would be putting the clock back. Gasped the governor. Have you no idea of progress of development? I've seen them both an egg. Said Caspian. We call it going bad in Narnia. This train must stop. I can take no responsibility for any such measure. Said Gumpus. Well then. Answered Caspian. We relieve you of your office. My lord, Byrne, come here. And before Gumpus quite realized what was happening, Byrne was kneeling with his hands between the king's hands and taking the oath to govern the Lone Islands in accordance with the old customs, rights, usages, and laws of Narnia. And Caspian said, I think we've had enough of governors. And made Byrne a duke, the duke of the Lone Islands. As for you, my lord, he said to Gumpus, I forgive you your debt for this tribute. But before noon tomorrow, you and yours must be out of the castle, which is now the Duke's residence. Look here, this is all very well, said one of Gumpus's secretaries. But suppose all you gentlemen stop play acting, and we do a little business. The question before us... The really, question is, said the Duke, whether you and the rest of the rabble will live without flogging or with one... You may choose which you prefer. When all this had been pleasantly settled, Caspian ordered horses, of which there were a few in the castle, though very ill-groomed, and he, with Byrne and Drinian and a few others, rode out into the town and made for the slave market. It was a long, low building near the harbor, and the scene which they found going on inside was very much like any other auction. That is to say, there was a great crowd, and Pug, on a platform, was roaring out in a raucous voice, Now, gentlemen, Lot 23, find here a Scythian agriculture laborer suitable for the mines or the galleys. Under 25 years of age, not a bad tooth in his head. Good brawny fella, take, take off his shirt, Jack, and let the gentleman see. There is muscle for you. Look at the chest on it. Ten crescents from the gentleman in the corner. You must be joking, sir. Fifteen? Eighteen. Eighteen is bid for Lot 23. Any advance on eighteen? 21. Thank you, sir. 21 is bid. But Pug stopped and gaped when he saw the mail-clad figures who had clanked up to the platform. On your knees, every man of you, to the king of Narnia, said the duke. Everyone heard the horses jingling and stamping outside, and many had heard some rumor of the landing and the events at the castle. Most obeyed. Those who did not were pulled down by their neighbors. Some cheered. 
Your life is forfeit, Pug. May lay a hand on a royal person yesterday, said Caspian. But your ignorance is pardoned. The slave trade was forbidden in all our dormant quarters for an hour ago. I declare every slave in this market free. He held up his hand to check the cheering of the slaves and went on. Where are my friends? Why, they were snapping up at once. We're here, we're here, Caspian, cried Lucy and Edmund together and... At your service, sir, piped Reap Cheap from another corner. They had all been sold, but the men who had bought them were staying to bid for other slaves, and so they had not yet been taken away. The crowd parted to let the three of them out, and there was great hand-clasping and greeting between them and Caspian. Two merchants of Kellerman at once approached. The Kellermen have dark faces and long beards. They wear flowing robes and orange-colored turbans, and they are a wise, wealthy, courteous, cruel, and ancient people. They bowed most politely to Caspian and paid him long compliments, all about the fountains of prosperity irrigating the gardens of prudence and virtue, and things like that. But of course what they wanted was the money they had paid. It is only fair, sirs, said Caspian. Every man who bought a slave today must have his money back. Uh, bring out your takings to the last minimum. A minimum is the fortieth part of a crescent. Does your good majesty need to beg on me? Find Pug. I have lived with broken hearts all your life, said Caspian. And you are bargain. It is better to bargain than a slave. But where is my other friend? Oh, him? Said Pug. Oh, take him and welcome. Glad to have him off my hands. I've never seen such a drug in the market in all my born days. Price him at five presents in the end, and even so nobody have him. Threw him in free with other lots, and still no one would have him. Wouldn't touch him. Wouldn't look at it. Fact, bring up Sulky. Thus, Eustace was produced, and Sulky he certainly looked. For though no one would want to be sold as a slave, it is perhaps even more galling to be a sort of utility slave whom no one will buy. He walked up to Caspian and said, I see, as usual, been enjoying yourself somewhere while the rest of us were prisoners. I suppose you haven't even found out about the British consul. Of course not. That night they had a great feast in the castle of Narrowhaven, and then... Tomorrow for the beginning of... The real adventure, said Reepicheep, when he had made his bows to everyone and went to bed. But it could not really be tomorrow or anything like it. For now they were preparing to leave all known lands and seas behind them, and the fullest preparations it's had to be made. The dawn treader was emptied and drawn on land by eight horses over rollers, and every bit of her was gone over by the most skilled shipwrights. Then she was launched again and victualled and watered as full as she could hold, that is to say, for 28 days. Even this, as Edmund noticed with disappointment, gave them only a fortnight's eastward sailing before they had to abandon their, pre their quest. While all of this was being done, Caspian missed no chance of questioning the oldest sea captains whom he could find in Narrowhaven to learn if they had any knowledge or even rumors of land further to the east. He poured out many a flagon of the castle ale to weather-beaten men with short gray beards and clear blue eyes, and many a tall yard he heard in return. But those who seemed the most truthful could tell of no lands beyond the lone islands, and many thought that if you sailed too far east, you would come into the surges of a sea without lands that swirled perpetually around the rim of the world. And that, I reckon, is where your majesty's friends went to the bottom. The rest had only wild stories of islands inhabited by headless men, floating islands, water spouts, and a fire that burned along the water. Only one, to reap a cheap's delight, said, And beyond that, Aslan country. But that's beyond the end of the world, and you can't get there. But when they questioned him, he could only say that he heard it from his father. Byrne could only tell them that he had seen his six companions sail away eastward and that nothing had ever been heard of them again. He said this when he and Caspian were standing on the highest point of Avra, looking down on the eastern ocean. I've often been up there, um, 
a morning, said the Duke. And seeing the sun come up out of the sea, and sometimes it looked as if it were only a couple of miles away. And I wondered about my friends and wondered that what there really was behind the horizon. Nothing most likely yet. I'm always half ashamed that I stayed behind, but I wish your majesty wouldn't go because he, we may need your help here. He, this closing the slave market might make a new world with Carlman is what I foresee. My Luigi think again. We have an oath, my lord, Duke, said Caspian. And anyway, I could I could say I go read. <laughs> And that is the close of chapter four. Your readers for tonight have been Carly, Sarah, Serena, Ruby, Josie, Caitlin, Bree, and of course, me, Tammy. Thanks for listening. Good night, Flagstaff.